oh, I could just break down campaigns all day with you. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's the only thing I know a lot about. So great. Right. Um, yeah, that's the point. Talk about the one thing you know the most about for an hour. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, it's exciting. It's been awesome to like connect with so many people that I've only met through email or met a couple times over the years and just talk about we have such a wealth of expertise just in our inner circle, just as a production company. So, so you're one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to be one of those people. <laughs> well, yeah. So it would be great if we could just start with who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Sarah Calabari, and in short, uh, I'm an integrated marketer. So what does that what does that even mean? Essentially, I do marketing strategy holistically. So you know, through my career, I've had times where I I focused on specific parts of marketing, but kind of with that end goal of kind of being able to dictate overall strategy that incorporates all the channels and a big part of my career has been in social but I've also worked in experiential marketing um you know my I started my career in in PR actually which is categories under communications so yeah done a little bit of this a little bit of that um and overall I bring it all together to come up with plans and and strategies that span any necessary channel Wow. Okay. So it sounds like a big part of what you focus on is making sure that a brand has a singular voice and is consistent through all channels and sort of wherever it exists in the world, you can recognize it as its own entity. Correct. That is definitely a big part of it. All right. <laughs> so you've been working with a bunch of companies on a bunch of different platforms. How is this year been going for you has anything changed all the talk around ai around tiktok is there something that's been grabbing your focus this year yeah so ai definitely comes up a lot um and just so i don't forget another big one that's been coming up is cookies uh google is doing away they've threatened this for a while but this is the year um where they are doing away with third-party cookies so that really affects marketers ability to it seems like attribution and some retargeting can get affected as well but I personally think it's also nice that marketers are going to be challenged to really focus on the creative that they put out so that they're not solely relying on that cookie data and you know and that they're actually putting in a lot of effort in the marketing collateral, like the the creative and, and capturing people's attention. And so what is an important part of a marketing campaign that's successful that, that still makes it feel like it has that authentic touch? Is it down to the colors, the images, the language you're using? What is something that, that really you feel brings a campaign to life? Well, all of the above. <laughs> it's also the thread that joins it all together, right? Like the angle, bringing the right image, the right mm. messaging, the right targeting, bringing all of that together, actually having a true understanding of your target audiences, truly understanding their pain points, uh, the language they use, knowing how to speak to your target audience, knowing um, what's going to capture their attention, and then yeah, when it comes to like the visual elements, whether it's images or video, just understanding how people operate or like experience different platforms where they will be met with your brand uh, content. Like for instance, you know, you have basically three seconds to capture someone's attention. So, um, you know, you got to make it good basically, you know. So I always like to jump right into the so what and have the brand like maybe like a logo watermark in the corner or something like that. You got to prove that you have content worth sharing, worth listening to. Exactly. I will say, I mean, I don't have the statistic to back this up, but I'm pretty sure if I were to do a quick Google search, I think most companies, most brands use Google Analytics behind their website. And of course, last year, Google kind of forced everyone onto GA4, and that's been a really big thorn in everybody's side as well in the marketing world. And it's really important to take it seriously, though, because, you know, you do want to be set up for success. So when you are running campaigns, you know that, like, you're confident that on the back end, 
everything's being, you know, all your web traffic is being captured accurately. So there's still a lot of people in 2024 kind of scrambling and just making sure that their GA4 instances are uh, buttoned up. All right. I kind of feel a little bit like that Michael Scott line where he's like, explain it to me like I'm five. <laughs> there's the X axis. You can see clearly on this page that we have a surplus. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's website analytics. Essentially, it's a Google product. And they used to call it Universal Analytics. Um, it was Google UA, Universal Analytics. They, for whatever reason, to everybody's chagrin or, you know, what, like no one is happy about it, they decided to just create a new platform for website analytics. And it's called GA4. Four. And it's vastly different. They just made a whole new platform, basically. And it's not intuitive <laughs> at all. Ugh. And so, you know, it's the numbers behind your website, basically, right? So like seeing um, how many people come to your site, come to specific pages. Let's say you want to track how far down a page someone has scrolled. That's called scroll depth. It could be a good indication of engagement with your content on that page, for instance, you know. So without getting into like super, super specifics, which sorry, I tend to do, it's the platform that most websites use uh, to measure the activity on their websites. I imagine that's going to get some people in trouble if the higher ups are expecting the same report as usual. Yes. Yeah, you just realize that you you're flying blind all of a sudden yeah. overnight. Yeah, and and actually that's a really great point that you brought up because things are not one to one. They don't measure the same way. It's not apples to apples. It's it's apples to oranges. Like you know, you can't compare your first year's GA four data to your last year's UA data super cleanly. Like it, it's just not going to match up. I will say another trend that I've personally been seeing um, on the brand side of things is I feel like there's been this resurgence of an appreciation and an understanding of brand campaigns, that awareness top level of the marketing funnel. Here's my thesis. Over the years with the especially the rise of digital marketing um, and the ability to kind of see measurable outcomes, like in, in part because of platforms like Google Analytics, right? Like we could measure website traffic, you know? So it was like, okay, we want to put money into Facebook because we can see the, how many clicks we get, uh, how much that's going to cost us. And then we see that, that outcome on the back end of the website of people going to the website. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we really want to put all our money and um, we expect that if we put this money in, people click through and they convert, you know, and, and that's just not how it works. Like over the years, it just seemed like people sort of forgot that you still need to build awareness. And a lot of, I would say, I think like decision makers didn't feel comfortable spending on awareness level campaigns which often were kind of like brand level brand messaging campaigns that kind mm -hmm. of just build that familiarity with a brand keep a brand top of mind but here's the deal if if a brand is not top of mind doesn't remain top of mind when a consumer whether it's a b2b or a b2c consumer um is ready to make a purchasing decision they've forgotten about you like you're no you're not going to be considered mm -hmm. so I think this year brands are starting to remember that yes no yeah I think okay let me well I'll rephrase the end the, the, okay. the second part just sure. to like see that I've gotten it right here businesses are hopefully realizing that you need to integrate more into people's lives provide content that's interesting and be part of their regular feed in order to have staying power so that when they need your product, you do come top of mind and you're not just one scroll that they sell one time. Basically, I mean, I think it's still important to look at metrics, like for the example that you, you know, said like a video, there's still value there, but it's at a kind of more granular level toward a larger goal. For a, for a long while, people basically just didn't believe in spending on awareness. And they thought that if they just put out an ad that's just like basically click here to buy this product 
you know, but then they would turn around and ask questions like, you know, why are so many people bouncing when they get to the landing page, you know, and it's like, because you didn't do the diligence up front in building trust with them, or, you know, there's a multitude of reasons. And I think that people are now coming back around to understanding that you got to build that trust first. Mm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Well, I guess, sort of in that vein, like, what is the best platform for B2B and explain what that is for people and the worst platform for B2B? Oh, okay. So B2B, that's the easy one first business to business. And one hot tip, and you've, you know, people might have heard this before, but I will say it's, uh, people really should remember that even a B2B buyer is an individual human being. It can feel like a brand is trying to just sell to this kind of faceless, an entire corporation or something, an entire enterprise. But truly, there's going to be an individual that receives your ad. You're talking to a human being, a single human being. They have a family or a pet or they just they have they have their own hobbies they have a life you know they're not purely this robot that just represents their company and and has no personality and 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 all that in terms of the best platform i think most people will probably say linkedin and they're not wrong but it's a little monopolistic and they're not the best (laughs) like It's uh, from a social media platform perspective, they're a little behind all the others. But the fact remains, they are the professional social network. Like that is where people go for professional networking, to find a job, to help their own thought leadership, you know, in a professional sense in their industries and that kind of thing. I do think that it is worth looking at trade publications as well, or industry publications rather. And, and, and if you're going to do it in a content way, just remember, like people can smell an ad from a mile away. So, (laughs) exactly. but if you've got an amazing headline, like if it looks pretty promising, people will read it. And if the content's good, they'll read it all the way through and it will work. Mm -hmm. I would say doing paid content pieces or like sponsored content pieces with these industry publications can be really effective if you do them well which is truly give insight and value in that article don't be overly salesy or or really salesy at all as someone who comes in to help with marketing and integration how do you channel your client's expertise into something like you almost have to it's kind of the same in our field as well you have to kind of become whatever the content is expert kind of overnight or like for the day yeah like I've had ones where I, I'm interviewing a doctor and I'm like okay yeah. now I need to like really be plugged in on heart surgery for the day so I can distill this video so it's relevant for the audience how do you do that on, on your side absolutely uh research 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 so you know, I, I just I, I don't want to be uh, condescending. So this might be just like kind of obvious to folks, but it's like literally Googling, you know, you go on their website, you go on their competitors websites, you look for news in the industry. That's pretty much it at a high level. I think it's, it's easier said than done, right? Like I think the how it's done. Okay, yeah, it's research, but then actually understanding if it's like a real like if it's in the aerospace industry, for instance, some of that stuff is really dense. And I am not an engineer. <laughs> um, just yeah. Especially not an aerospace engineer. And don't be afraid to ask questions. And I always try to push to speak with the subject matter experts within the clients w- within their uh, workforce, right? So often you're working with other marketers, And they also may not have the depth of knowledge necessary to create the messaging that will connect or resonate with your target audience. So if I need to make an ad that an an aerospace engineer, for instance, will care about. (laughs) Well, yeah, care about. Great. Right. Yeah. Like catch their attention. I need to know the words they use. I need to know what they care about and talk about that in the ad. But I can tell you right now. I wouldn't just know that, <laughs> um, you know, I, I was uh, a psych and comms major. So do, yeah. I do not know what they look for. You got to talk to the experts. Um, and I, I think you got to push to talk to them if they're not, you know, already the people you're talking to. Yeah, no. And I think that's an important point. It's not condescending because a lot of people skip that step. The end product is simplified, is 
straightforward and gives you exactly what you need. But the only reason you can get there is by learning all of it first and then distilling it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so we've brought up the target audience a couple times. So I just kind of want to zero in on that. When you're, you have a new client and they want to get their target audience on board, mm -hmm. how do you go about figuring out who exactly that is? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> From the perspective of an agency working with a client. Obviously, the first step is talking to the client and from their perspective, getting who, who they think their target audience is. What you'll find, though, is that sometimes they um, may not fully understand who their target audience or audiences are um, or like it's changed over time or they're a new company and, you know, they made it really far without ever fully doing their due diligence in terms of figuring out their their target audiences. So when there's budget for it, and I will say just being very realistic, that's often the biggest barrier is doing primary research can be costly. So if budget permits, it's amazing to do primary research, would be, which would be to like hold focus groups and do surveys and, you know, really talk to mm -hmm the supposed target audiences and figure out truly from from their perspective if they're the right audience or not and in speaking to them you might even just learn from them who else might be the right audience or who should be the audience instead of them um, or at the very least you might find out they're not the right audience so you can go off of a new hypothesis you know and best case scenario you find out they are the right audience and amazing great but also you learn in that process not only do you figure out who they are and the details around that like what motivates them their pain points you can also ask them like what uh, media they consume so you can find out like maybe they're not on LinkedIn right um, maybe they are uh, on Reddit for instance for a more technical mm -hmm. crowd they might actually be on Reddit or YouTube more you can find out stuff like that uh, in those conversations and those types of surveys and stuff as well. We talked to Barry Reichter about this, actually. <laughs> Have you worked with him? Technically, I think we did overlap. Funny enough, Anthony just recently last week reached out about a potential project with Barry, but Barry did not respond to us via text. So. <laughs> right, well, Barry, if you're listening, <laughs> text Sarah back. <laughs> <laughs> but he brought up you know just how valuable metrics could be but I could see how it's a luxury especially I mean so many brands are created with an audience in mind so hopefully yeah. they're, they're accurate more often than not just just knowing themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also this is kind of a tangent we might cut this but it's <laughs> We're kind of in the Wild West. Wendy's had a mean Twitter for a while. <laughs> Beyond Beef has like a really scandalous threads now. Like it does seem like people are sort of throwing things at the wall or maybe there's companies where the, the upper brass do, don't really understand the importance of it. So it's interesting to see if any of that weird stuff sticks over time. I and I, millions of others, I think, are like fangirling, fanboying, whatever, fan peopling over the National Parks Instagram account. Yes. I have so many emotions about it. I think a big one I'm, you know, ashamed to admit it, I think is just envy because especially like back in the day when I first started my career, like I really wanted to instill in brands that they can they can be relatable, they can be fun, you know? Mm -hmm. And even if it's something kind of serious, it's you don't have to be boring. <laughs> it's like there's some rule, but there isn't a rule. You have to be accurate. You have to be truthful, but you don't have to be boring. And in fact, think about it. Like if you're not boring, people will actually consume your important messaging. Hats off to the person who's running the, the National Parks Instagram because it is hilarious and you also learn a lot. So I think they're a fantastic example of just doing it right. Yeah. And it's a hard line to walk. I think there is this epic question of how can you be authentic, but still be trustworthy and professional? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to do it and a lot of ways to do it wrong. So yeah, overall, I, I have a soapbox or a motto or I love a good soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. 
<laughs> my soapbox thing. Um, I used to say this for social because again, I just I worked a lot in social. But the truth is, it actually applies to all marketing. Really, you want to provide value. So, what's the key to good social? What's the key to a good ad? It's providing value. And what does that mean? What is value? It usually breaks down to either entertainment, education, or community. Um, and on social, one of the gold standards is, would someone share this? Yeah. Um, that's going to be like the the best. <laughs> that is going to perform as an ad way better than some sort of high-level ad where you're just sort of talking at people about something that they don't care about or they don't realize they care about because – they didn't even take the minute to figure out if they care about it because it just looks so boring. It looked like an ad and they didn't even pay attention. That's my soapbox. That's a great soapbox. I love that. Thank you. Another angle is I, I do enjoy showing B2B brands, introducing them to tactics and ideas that start to break that mold a little bit. It can just be kind of satisfying because they're more effective too. And I am a big, like, I do like to see the metrics go up, right? Like, I like to see Mm. costs go down and conversions go up. Like, that's really satisfying. It's a visual indicator that what I'm doing works and it's just a very satisfying feeling. I'm a big fan of, like, testing things, experimenting Sometimes, you know, the model is maybe like you start off with just some hypotheses, but then you you look at the numbers and make some hard decisions there, right? Like you might need to just completely cut out a channel, double down on a channel, you know? So it's important to be flexible in marketing and, you know, not stick to something just because you said you were going to, even if the numbers show that it's just not really working. Do you have any closing thoughts about the current media landscape? <laughs> I'm hopeful because I think I'm seeing the change. A good example of that whole awareness thing I was talking about is the solo stoves recent. I'm, I'm sure you saw. I don't know how you could. Maybe you didn't see it, so I shouldn't assume. But like it was everywhere. Uh, the Snoop Dogg campaign with solo stoves. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Snoop Dogg. Yes, I yeah. did see Okay. <laughs> okay. I like fell for it. I fully was like, why did he say it that weird? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Like they were recently in headlines again, or they made headlines again because they fired the CEO mm. and it, you know, in the same articles that talked about firing the CEO. They also talked about how they felt that the campaign ultimately wasn't actually effective because it didn't immediately produce the volume of sales they were hoping for or expecting. And there's several lessons here, I guess, or a couple lessons at least. Like one, it's a good reminder when you're talking about marketing and and campaigns and all that, it's so important to establish realistic expectations and goal setting up front. An awareness campaign is typically not going to immediately lead to sales. You know what I mean? Like they didn't even know who you were. So it's going to take a a bit. Then the second thing is it just sort of reiterates that whole, the general whole concept here of an awareness campaign, a, a brand campaign versus a demand generation campaign. And, you know, overall, it was just also kind of silly because it was going into the winter months. And overall, I just think it was silly to not give it some time um, and see if sales could pick up later. And to just discount what it did accomplish just seems so silly. So I'm hoping to see not that (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, in 2024, like people actually understanding that brand campaigns have a purpose and uh, understanding the differences there and and understanding that that needs to be done first before someone actually purchases from you. Oh, and then another great marketing story from the past year has been Twitter to X. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, uh. There's going to be like books about that one day, how colossally insane that was to do. (laughs) And that's actually, that that is a very good case study in branding as well because so, so so traditionally, product is actually part of marketing, right? But a lot of brands don't treat it that way. 
there's like an operations team. I don't know. There's there's people who like make the product or the service, and then they've got their marketing team in a silo. And even worse is when it's like a B two B company, and then their marketing and their sales team aren't super intertwined. Like I don't understand why that is actually kind of the norm, like the rule. Like it's the exception to have a marketing and sales team that actually talks to each other, which is insane. You know, you've got the folks making the actual products in one silo and you've got like marketing folks in the other silo. And oftentimes people will think that doing more with the marketing could somehow sell in a product that simply doesn't fit the market. Mm. Like it's its own magic power marketing. Yeah. And it's like, it, that's, and that's the, that's the lipstick on the pig thing. It's like, you're going to have to hemorrhage money. Yeah. <laughs> it's like either you need to fix the product or fix who you're targeting. So it's like, maybe the persona is right. And they are going after the right pain points, but their product is simply subpar to their competitors. And instead of fixing that, they're just like, no, marketing, like, like, put more money into this channel, or, oh, you're doing it wrong. Like, why isn't this channel working? It must be the the executors. Let's go let's switch to a different agencies and it's like no dude fix your product man like it's not as good as the competitors why would anyone ever buy this right and then your job turns into like how to trick people yeah exactly <laughs> and then on the reverse sometimes it's like fine the products the products actually solid but maybe the pain point you're solving for is not a pain point so i guess that's kind of the way in which this is a triangle rather than like Two, it's not just product and persona, but also that pain point. Maybe the pain point that you're solving for isn't really a pain point after all, or it's not strong enough of a pain point to pay the price of your product. And then there's that other one where it's like, you might just be a little bit wrong about your target audiences. This whole episode now has come full circle of like, know thyself, know thy product. <laughs> like Elon Musk, if you're too close to your product, you don't actually understand what people use it for yeah. or what they value. Yeah. You're doomed from the start. No marketing can fix that. Yeah. Sarah, thank you so much. We really got into a lot of stuff. This is so interesting and I'm fascinated by it. So um, I'm always kind of just as a layman keeping track of the big brands. So it'll be fun to view it all through this lens now. Awesome. So yeah, thanks for spending the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Super fun. And thank you for tuning in. We'll see you all in two weeks. <laughs>